some curious. Do you know how many years it has been since you have graduated from high school? How many, do some, do some of the math in your head. I see some people laughing already, okay. You know, uh, do, uh, do I got any 10 years or less people, some young folk in the room? We got some youngins. Okay, we got some, okay, I like that. Anybody around like the 20-year range, kind of just in that range area? Do I got anybody who's brave enough to say you break 50 years? You break the 50-year gap since, since high school. Do I got anybody brave enough? 60 years. Anybody top 60 years? Do I got any? Oh, we got a couple. Let's go. Okay, 60 years. Uh, my mom called me the other day. She said, Brian, I got invited to my 40th high school reunion. I said, Mom, that officially makes you old. I don't know what else to say. 40, I mean, come on, that like four years since high school. Now, I understand every generation and era kind of has a different high school experience, but maybe if you're kind of closer to my age range, there were some very clear categories of people, at least when I was in high school. So you had the jocks and the cheerleaders, very obvious, okay? They were a little more popular. They kind of liked to party. They were just that group. Uh, you had the nerds when I was in high school. These were the people who would custom program their TI-83 calculators. They were just very smart. Um, they got picked on, but now they got the last laugh because all those nerds are now the surgeons and the CEOs in our culture. So they win in the end. Now, a related group, but they do deserve their own category, would be the band geeks, okay? Do you got any clarinet players in the room or trumpet players? Okay, all you band geeks in the room. Now, also, some may remember the goths. You remember the goths? All the Hot Topic shoppers, lots of black, a lot of eye makeup. Those were the goths when I was in high school. Now, there's one last group that I will say was truly special. I deserve, they, they deserve a special mention right now, and that was the theater kids. Do you know, yes, I expected that from the theater kids, okay? That's exactly what I expected. Now, here is what I noticed, at least when I was in high school. For the most part, everybody kind of recognized and respected these different groups. Now, you wouldn't easily fit in a group that you weren't a part of, but we all kind of existed peacefully together. Now, even as adults, here's what I've noticed, though. People still like to kind of group up and form different cliques. So in my own neighborhood, there are different little pockets of people. Uh, there's some pockets based on kind of how old your kids are, stage of life. There's pockets based on what school maybe your kids go to. Those people kind of talk to each other. We have political pockets in our neighborhood, interest pockets. They just kind of exist. And yet, while that's true, we all kind of just hang out with people we fit better with. It's just a part of life. There is also a reality that where there may be some cliques in our culture today, there are also camps. There are total camps of people. Now you got camps that will not even talk to each other in our current cultural climate. You have camps that hate each other's guts. We have entire countries that cannot coexist while the other one is in existence even right now. So the question you gotta ask is, is that just what it is? That's just life. That's how humans work. We are in a perpetual state of high school drama. That is just what it is. Or maybe there's some more going on here. Maybe there's a different way we can approach this thing. And there's actually a passage in the New Testament that gives a somewhat surprising framework for how we are to engage with people we absolutely disagree with. Not even disagree with, but how you might engage with people who are even totally wrong in some of the things they believe in positions they hold. And so we're going to look at this. This is a letter written by Paul in the first century. And in this portion of Scripture we're going to look at, he actually talks to these people about how he navigates the complexity of the culture of their day. And I think it has a lot to say to us even here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to start in verse 19. Look what Paul says. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Now, Paul is laying a foundation right here with where he's going to go. And first, he talks about this freedom he has. Paul is pointing to the fact that Jesus has now set him free from trying to earn God's love and approval through, through different regulations, religious rituals, even just the expectations of other people in human systems. He's like, I have been set free by Jesus. Praise the Lord. But then he says... I've also chosen to make myself a slave to everyone. And so Paul is saying, I voluntarily give up the freedoms I have in my own faith for the sake of other people. 
and ultimately says the goal is to win people. Paul is saying, I want people to experience the same life transforming power and love of Jesus that I have. I want them to be free too. So what does this even look like? What is Paul talking about? How does that even work? Like truly, where is he going? Well, Paul now is going to go into some detail for what this looks like in his everyday life. And this is going to be a mouthful. I'm going to read all of it at once, and I promise we'll tee this out. So let's just push through. Look what Paul says. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law, to the weak, I became weak, to win the weak, and he summarizes the whole thing. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. So that was a mouthful. Very simply, what Paul is doing here is he is talking about some of the major segments of his society at the time. So Paul's like, hey, we got these Jews over here. They got what they believe, they're doing their thing. But he also talks about these people who are under the law too. He's pointing to people who are not ethnically Jewish, but were still practicing the Jewish faith, the Jewish law. Then he says there's people who are not under the law. These would be anybody who's not Jewish. So they'd be like Gentiles, probably a lot of us in here, right? And then he even talks about these people who are weak, who we'll talk about in just a minute. But really what Paul is saying is, I have learned how to navigate all the cliques and camps of my culture. Paul is saying, I have learned how to build trust and relationships with people I have absolutely nothing in common with. People who I even think are wrong in what they believe and how they live. Now stop right there. Think about how radical that idea really is. Think about how countercultural that approach really is to how the world operates and especially our current cultural moment. I thought it'd be fun to kind of just illustrate just how mind blowing this is. I got a friend, Ivan, that I asked if he'd be willing to come up for just a minute. Can you guys give him a hand as he's coming up? He said he would. He doesn't know what's coming right now, but he's gonna be, come on up, man, walk around the stairs. And as Ivan's coming up, we got a little thing here that I thought would kind of help illustrate our cultural moment here, dude. And I'm gonna have you go over to that little platform. You take one end of this rope. This is gonna be a little fun. So I picked a young guy for this because we're gonna be doing, we're gonna be going up and down here, bud. So let's think for just a moment. Me and Ivan are hanging out here. Pretty much anybody you engage with in this world, you are going to have gaps with. We're, we're going to believe different things. We're going to have different stances. We might have different politics, different financial situations. There are just gaps between us. Now, think about how our world typically operates with this reality. I look at someone like Ivan, I say, hey, Ivan, you're dumb. What are you, what are you doing over there, man? You are so wrong. You are stupid. Last week, you are an idiot, dude. What are you doing over on that side? So what do we say? You need to come over here to this camp. So you know what? I'm going to attack you. I'm going to shame you. We're going to argue and debate in public because why not? Let's do it in front of the kids, Ivan. Okay, let's fight about this thing. You know, I'm going to post on social media too. You get over here. And what do we do? We pull as hard as we can to try to get people to come over to us. Now, what happens when you start putting tension on this rope? What's Ivan gonna do? What do you start doing, man? You're pulling back, right? And eventually we get to a moment where we're digging our heels in and we're in an absolute battle. Now let's pretend for even half a second that I could actually win against Ivan. I see your biceps under that shirt, man. Let's pretend, let's pretend I actually won this thing. Okay, I just dunked on him. Oh, I proved him wrong. I did my homework. I had facts and data and statistics. Yeah, you definitely got the wrong candidate. You did the whole thing wrong, man. I got you. Does Ivan want to come over to my side right now? Oh, you better believe he hates my guts right now. And he doesn't just hate me. He now hates every single thing I associate with, which may even include my faith now. So, Ivan, let's get back on the platform. Let's ask the question, how does Jesus engage with us? Well, you got to think, the gap between us and God is the greatest gap there is. It's the ultimate gap. It's the impossible gap to close. And what did Jesus do? He didn't start pulling and say, you get your life together, Ivan. 
What is wrong with you? Fix it. Get over to my side. What does Jesus do? He drops the rope. And even when he had all the freedom in the world, think about Jesus, the king of the universe. He can do what he wants. He gave up that freedom. And he left heaven. You can stay up there, Ivan. You stay up on your pro. Oh, yeah, you get back up. So I picked a young guy. And Jesus came to us. He came to our side. He moved to us. And he didn't just do that. He died for us to close the gap. And then Jesus didn't even stop there. He gave us his presence, his love, his power, and he brought us to the life he made us for, his forgiveness, his grace, and ultimately a hope for eternity. Now that's what Jesus does. So Ivan, I'm going to have you go back to that platform over there. Pick up that rope. So if we are Christians, how are we to behave? We well, see, if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't pull and yank people to your side. You drop the rope. And because Jesus did it for you, you're even willing to leave your own comfort zone. You're willing to leave your preferences. You're willing to even leave your own camp and go to people. Because at the end of the day, the goal of a Christian is not to defeat people, it is to win them. That's what a Christian does. Can we thank Ivan real quick, man? Thank you for being a good sport, man. You can go take a seat. That one single idea has the potential to completely change the political climate of our world. This has the potential to totally change the way your relationships function. I mean, this is absolutely world-changing when you really think about it. And packed into this little section of scripture is a whole framework for how Christians are to engage the complexity of the cultural moment we find ourselves in. So let's unpack what Paul is saying here. Where is Paul going? Well, first thing Paul is really charging us to do is to make sure that you understand your context. Look what Paul said. He said, I have become all things to all people. Paul is saying, I know how to deal with the people who come into my space. I learn where they're coming from. I know their beliefs. I know how to navigate the nuance of the different situations. Paul's like, God, Jews, great. I disagree with them on a million things now that I'm a Christian. I got people who are over here who are Gentiles doing totally different religions and everything. I can navigate that too. I'm willing to go to them and do this whole thing. The first week of this series, we said that if you choose to follow Jesus, you will become a foreigner of sorts. You are not going to fit perfectly in this world and its systems. And while that's true, you still have to learn how to understand where you are in this world. You have to learn how to navigate this current cultural moment. And especially because of the current season we're in right now as a country, it'd be really helpful for all of us to be aware of even the political context we find ourselves in. You know, every part of the country has a different political kind of subculture. You know, California is not Arkansas, which is not Illinois, which is not Florida, right? We all got these different little pockets in our world, but Colorado has its own too. And I know we got a lot of people from different states online. So glad to have you. Maybe you can think of your context. I need to talk to the Coloradans now for just a minute, okay? All the Colorado folks. Now, our church is in an interesting location because we actually kind of have more of a regional poll. We pull from a lot of different areas and we primarily pull from four different counties. I know there's some more, but for the most part, this will work for our purposes. So if you even think about just our current moment, our location, where we're at right now, if you are somebody who lives in Adams County, for example, this is pretty much what the breakdown looks like for you. About 60% more left, 40% more right. Again, I'm rounding, but this will work for our purposes. If you are somebody who's in Broomfield, these are my people, that's where I live. It's 65 more Democratic, 35% more Republican. My Weld County people, who are all trying to become Wyoming right now, um, you're about 40% Democrat, 60% Republican, and then even Boulder, we pull from Boulder County as well. More 80% Democrat, 20% Republican. Now I know what somebody are thinking with that stat. You're like, 20% Republican Boulder? No. Maybe 20 people, but not 20% of the whole county. Now, 
here's what's also interesting about our church, our particular location as a church. Our church falls within the 8th Congressional District in Colorado. Now, this is actually the most politically competitive district in the entire state. Just two years ago, the election was determined by less than 1% just in this district. And some political pundits are saying this may be one of the most competitive districts in the entire country here in November, right where we live. Now, why do I even tell you all that right now? It'd be good for all of us to recognize that we live in an extremely politically diverse area. And one of the most politically diverse really in the country. Here's what this means. You are going to live around, go to work with, raise your kids with, and even go to church with people who have very different convictions and beliefs and positions than you. And if you want to be effective as a follower of Jesus, you have to learn how to navigate this reality. And this is where the problem is. <laughs> because this is what often happens so much. We have a bad habit, even Christians, let's own this, of not just disagreeing with people sometimes, we demonize them, don't we? You don't believe what I believe? You are like the scum of the earth. Like you should not exist anymore in the name of Jesus, right? We had that little tag. Now, let's just assume that line of thinking, okay? Let's assume that for just a minute. So you ask somebody, hey, do you think those people who believe those things, hold those convictions, maybe even vote that way? Do you think they're going to hell maybe? You know, there are actually people that say, oh yeah, I actually do. I don't think you can think those things or do those things if you really love Jesus. And I would say, okay, you think they're going to hell? Well, doesn't that make them the mission field then? Aren't those the people we're supposed to be reaching? Aren't those the people you're supposed to be moving towards and loving and serving? And see, this is what Paul knows. You can't reach somebody that you are creating a gap with. The whole goal of a Christian is to close gaps, to move towards people. This is why Paul says, I'll become anything I need to for people. I will adapt, I'll adjust, I will go to them for the sake of closing these gaps. Coloradans, you have to understand your context. You have to see where you are and you have to be way more culturally savvy than a lot of other people in our country right now. You have to be way more savvy than somebody in San Francisco right now. You have to be way more savvy than somebody in Birmingham right now because it's just a lot more complex here. Uh, Nicole and I had some neighbors over just for dinner a couple weeks ago. Friday night, kids are playing, music's going, there's food, it's just a vibe, okay? It's just one of those awesome, chill Friday nights. And one of the couples at this hangout just could not help themselves. They had to bring up politics. They just went there. And so they said, well, you guys know where we stand. There is absolutely no way we can vote for that guy. And another couple just could not help themselves either. They said, oh, really? You think she's a better option? So what I did is I just went and I got some popcorn and I got a chair and I just sat down and I was like, let's go right now in my house. <laughs> this is the reality of Colorado. It is messy. You've got people who have so many different beliefs and thoughts and convictions. It is complex. It is hard. Right now, you have people with two different signs living right next to each other in your own neighborhood. And I love it. Because what an honor that God would call you to one of the most complex environments in our country right now. What an honor that God would call you to the front lines of some of the hardest gaps to close in our culture right now. God placed you here for this moment at this time. God must think something of you if he has you here in Colorado right now at this time in our country. What a privilege. And so we have to embrace this, everybody. You have to just understand your context and you have to learn to love this. It's a fun game to play if you really lean to it. And 
God will use you in ways you never even imagined if you can learn how to navigate this. So it's not just understanding, though. There's a second step to this that builds on the first. Every single one of us, we have to commit to this. We have to avoid alienating people unnecessarily. Paul has another letter in the New Testament, Colossians. Look what he says here in chapter 4. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Now here, outsiders, uh, Paul is talking about just people who are not Christians. They're just outside the Christian faith. And Paul is saying, you cannot be acting a fool around people who do not yet love Jesus. Because they are going to draw conclusions about God based on your behavior. Just back in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul mentioned another category of people. Maybe you caught it. He said, to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. Now that's interesting. Who is Paul talking about here? Well, based on the context, uh, we can safely assume Paul is talking about people who you would say have a fragile conscience. Now what do we mean by that? One chapter earlier, Paul says this, be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights, your freedoms as a Christian, does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. Now, in Paul's particular context, um, pretty much all the different religions had a form of animal sacrifice that they practiced. And they would do these animal sacrifices, but then use the extra meat and they would sell it in the stores. So you'd go around to the King Supers or whatever, and you'd be buying meat, and a lot of it would have been used in animal sacrifices for different religions. Now, Paul, this is how crazy like, it is for Paul to say this. He's like, you are so free as a Christian, you can eat that meat. Because he's like, you know who God is. These idols are nothing. You can eat that meat with a clean conscience, not even an issue. I mean, wow, that's mind-blowing. But Paul also says, but you got to understand the people you're dealing with, too. Because at that time, there were a lot of Christians who came out of these pagan religions. And for them to eat that meat felt like they were going back to their old life and these old religions they practiced. And so they just couldn't do it. Their conscience wouldn't let them do it. And then there were other people who weren't Christians, but then they'd see Christians sometimes eating this meat and they'd be like, hold up, I thought you followed Jesus. Or do you worship our gods too then? So they got all confused. So Paul is saying here, there are people whose consciences just can't handle certain things, even though you're free to do it as a Christian. And so Paul says, in love, if you eating this meat would be an issue for somebody else, then don't eat it. I know you wanted the steak, but we're going vegan tonight in the name of love. <laughs> and you see that tension there. Paul says, because you care about these people, because you ultimately want them to get closer to God, you don't want to do anything that's going to cause them to stumble, even if they are the one who's technically wrong. They're weaker. They're not there yet in their faith. Now, how might this look just in today's day and age? What may be an example for us? A, a simple one. You might have a friend who you know has had issues with alcohol maybe over the years. Maybe they're just coming out of it. Maybe they're not quite there. Maybe they still struggle. Well, if you really are a good friend, you're not taking them to a bar when you go out. You're not bringing them over to your house and putting 20 drinks in front of them because you love them. And you don't want to put them in a position where they might stumble or even struggle. Now, I actually think this principle of just this weaker conscience and people who struggle with things actually applies to our political climate today as well. Follow me. There are some people that you are going to encounter, especially in this next month, that are incapable of having an adult conversation about certain things. I see some nods. You guys know what I'm talking about here. There are people that if you try even talking about something, they are totally going to shut down. They're going to fly off the handle. If you even indicate a position on something, they're not going to disagree with you. They are going to have to totally disassociate with you because they just can't even handle that in their brains. If they even get an inkling of who you're even voting for, you might as well consider the friendship over. Does anybody have some of these people that you know? Okay. Yes. You might have some family members, all that. That's kind of weak at the end of the day, isn't it? It's a, it's a little weak to not be able to handle it. And, and, and we understand that. It's just the cultural moment we live in. There's a little bit more fragility when it comes to the way some people think and act. Now, here's how some people approach this. You can jump on social media and see this all the time. People will go out in public, they'll go to college campuses, and they'll try to find these weaker people. And they'll try to engage in a debate with them. 
And you can watch these videos of people totally dunking on folks who have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> and then they prove them wrong and they feel all smug that they prove their point. And here's what you discover. You can win an argument and still lose the person. Because if you watch these videos, what happens is these guys pick up the rope. They're like, yep, you're dumb, you're stupid, I'm right, you're wrong. And they pull the person off the platform. And what does that person do? Have you ever seen the video where they're like, oh, thank you for shaming me in public on social media. Let's be friends. No, they're like, I hate you. We will never get along. Whatever you're connected to, I want nothing to do with. And what does it do? It just creates greater gaps. So you have to be very sensitive to the fact that sometimes your discussions with certain people could end up being counterproductive. Even though you're right, even though you know exactly what you're talking about and they don't, you could end up unnecessarily alienating them, potentially even from Jesus himself. And so you just have to wrestle with this hard question. Would you rather win someone to your politics or win them to Jesus? Because that's a decision you're going to have to make in certain conversations and certain relationships. Um, I was talking to a friend a few weeks ago on the phone. We're just chatting, having casual conversation. And I just happened to mention a church in this conversation, not even thinking anything about it. And without hesitation, my friend goes, oh, the Republican church. And I was like, what do you mean? the Republican church. He's like, oh, well, anybody who doesn't vote Republican is never going to feel welcome in that church. And I was thinking, what a shame that the first thing somebody thought about when they thought of a church was a political allegiance. Like, why did my friend say, oh, yeah, that church that loves people so well? Did you see the stuff they do in the community? It's amazing. Or, oh, man, that church, man, they're just so welcoming. and kind. Of, that church that's really about Jesus? Yeah, I know that church. And now there are going to be tons of people in the communities around this church that will never step foot in that place because of how it has postured itself when it comes to politics. Now, I want you guys to know that my prayer is that it would never be the case that when somebody thinks of New Hills Church, the first thing that comes to their mind is politics. May that never be the case for our church. Because I would rather win someone to my savior than my political preferences. I just, I would. This is a very dangerous temptation for churches right now in particular. Because there are churches that genuinely believe they are taking a stand and they're saying what they need to say, but what they are actually doing is unnecessarily undermining their witness and alienating people, not just from their church, but from Jesus. We've actually had a lot of conversations about this as a staff and leadership, hours of conversations, multiple meetings at this point of just how do we want to posture ourselves as a church, knowing our context our community, where we are right now in this time. And we've just all agreed, we don't want to do ministry in a way that unnecessarily pushes people further away from God, that unnecessarily makes them think that they may not be welcome in this community. And so we've just decided we are going to be a church where everyone is welcome. Anybody can come in here and be loved. And at the end of the day, we do this because we know we're ultimately not trying to win somebody to a party. We're trying to win them to a person. That is what we are trying to do as a church, okay? So it's been really kind of funny going through this series this last month because I've had some conversations with people offline and they're like, Brian, some of these messages, I was just waiting. I thought you were going to say it. I just, I was waiting for it. I don't even know what it was, but you were going to say it. And then other people are like, dude, I, is, it, is it like coming in this series or whatever? And I actually, I know kind of exactly what you mean, though, when we have those conversations, because I could say things. I have the freedom to say it. I got the microphone right now. I can make that little sarcastic remark. I could throw out that little jab. I could even make a little joke at one side's expense, and I could probably get everybody in here to laugh. 
But I want you guys to know that there's a reason why I've intentionally avoided some of those things. Because on one level, I do not want to create a culture in this church of dishonoring government authorities. We talked about that in week two. Because dishonoring government authority, it's disobedience to God. I mean, that's a big deal to God. At the same time, the reason I am so cognizant of this is because I can make one little comment. And for 90% of us in this room, you'd think it was harmless. You thought it was playful. You didn't think it was a big deal at all. But for other people, they walk out thinking, I can't come to this church anymore. Your sister says, that's just not the church for me. I, clearly, I'm not welcome there. You now make a mental note in your mind, okay, as much as I'd love to bring my neighbor to this church, I'm not totally sure what they might say there. They might say that one unnecessary thing that didn't need to be said, and now they don't really feel like they can come to this church. It's just unnecessary. Why would we alienate people over things that ultimately are not that important? And so I just want you guys to have the trust and confidence in this church that you can bring anyone to this place and they're going to feel like they're welcome and at home here. That's what I want. And at the end of the day, I know some people might be thinking, but Brian, that kind of feels like the coward's way out. Like, I think you need to say it. You need to take a stand. And I would say, oh, we are taking a stand. We're taking a stand for Jesus. That is the stand that we're taking as a church. We're planting our feet on the ground. That's the stand we're taking. And so, regardless of where you come from, here's what I want you to know. This is the message of our church. You are welcome here. You are. We want you here. Not only that, this is what I want you to know. There's a God in heaven who loves you. He actually came to this earth for you. Jesus, he died in your place. He is alive even now. And he wants to change your life in ways you could have never even imagined. That is what we want for you at this church. So guys, we got to be wise. You can't be acting a fool. You got to know who you're dealing with. And there are many people in your life who just can't handle those conversations. They're just not there. They are weaker in some ways in those particular areas. And we have to be the kind of people that can meet people right where they're at. We are the ones who close the gaps. We are the ones who go to them and not wait for them to come to us. And I made this very clear. I want to make sure that point is very clear. We want to avoid alienating people unnecessarily, right? Now, I will say this. Here's where the tension lays. There are times where it may be necessary. There are going to be times in your life where you're just going to have to hold your ground. You're going to have to speak truth. You're going to have to do it in love, and you're not going to be able to accommodate for certain people. I had one person in my small group say, you know, at the end of the day, Brian, it's compassion without compromise. That's what it is. Paul says this in Romans 12, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So as much as you can do within your power, you are trying to close gaps. You're trying to get along with people. You're trying to live at peace. And yet Paul says, as much as it's possible, as much as it depends on you, which means there will be times you have done everything you possibly could to get along with people, to be their friend, to close the gap, and they still will choose to move away from you and even move away from God. And there's just nothing else you can do about it. You gotta think real hard about that social media post because you might post it and get some likes and positive comments and feedback, but then you gotta ask the question, does this unnecessarily alienate my family or friends who I know just don't agree? Is it worth it? And you might say, well, Brian, I can do whatever I want. It's my right, it's my account. Okay, yeah, absolutely. You're also a follower of Jesus, though. So how do you live in that tension? I know we've got some people in our church right now. You are running for an elected office this year, and I am praying for you, and I'm so glad that we have people that want to step into the political space, and you, by associating yourself with the political party, have already alienated a bunch of people. You couldn't even help it. And that's just the reality. You have chosen that field, so that just comes with the territory. But now you have to figure out what does it look like to navigate this space and try to close as many gaps as you can. Is it worth having that argument with that person? 
You're not going to change their mind anyway. You already know it. You might be able to dunk on them. You might be able to make them feel stupid. But are you unnecessarily undermining potential future conversations about Jesus? That, that's what you have to figure out, church. We have to navigate the context with wisdom and love. And we never want to unnecessarily push somebody away from us and especially away from God. Now, there's one more thing we got to cover here as we get ready to close. Last thing we got to do, church, we have to focus on the ultimate win. There are a lot of areas in our culture right now where people are trying to win. People are trying to win positions right now. People are trying to win power. Policies are trying to win right now. Platforms are trying to win right now. And that's all really important. You're probably seeing all the ads like I am right now too on all the platforms. This matters because all of us in here, we should hope that the best person wins at the end of the day. We should hope that the best policies win at the end of the day. Like you should participate. I do think as Christians, we should be engaged in the whole process. But Paul said, the reason I go to such lengths to move towards people, to enter their space and close gaps is not because of those things at the end of the day. Paul says, I have one ultimate win that I'm focusing on. And Paul says, it is to win as many as possible so that by all possible means, I might save some. Church, we have to remember, the single greatest win is seeing somebody saved by Jesus. That is the greatest win there is. It's the most important one. Our vote matters, but our Christian witness matters more. And so we just have to keep our priorities straight in this moment. It's worth being inconvenienced for this. It's worth even giving up some of your preferences. It's sometimes worth not making a point for the sake of that person. We actually have a value at our church. It's one of our core values. It's this, we go. And we say it this way, we pursue kingdom advancement with unapologetic urgency. To reach new people, we must take new hills and try new things. Our ultimate goal as a church is not to promote or push our own agendas, church. It is to move the purposes of God forward in this world. That is what we are called to do. And we will never compromise our commitment to Jesus, our commitment to his word. We will always strive to live by the standards of God, but we will do everything within our ability to close gaps with people, to bring them closer to Jesus. As Paul says, by all possible means to do this in people's lives. So New Hills, let's be a church that wins people. Let's be a church that can transcend some of the cliques and camps of our day. Let's be a church that puts the rope down and let's bring the transforming love of Jesus to a world that desperately needs it. Amen, amen. Let's pray together everybody, Lord, we just praise you in this place right now. Jesus, that you would leave heaven to come to us. You closed the ultimate gap for us, Jesus. You gave up all your freedoms. You even went to a cross for us. That is how much you wanted to come to us, Lord. And God, will that reality, can you use that to please just transform our own hearts? Lord, can we live with the same posture that you would help us just step out and be willing to be inconvenienced, to navigate the complexity for the sake of closing gaps with people, for the sake of winning them, for the sake of seeing them saved by you, God. Lord, will you help us keep our priorities straight? Lord, will you help us navigate the complexity of Colorado with grace and wisdom? And God, will you please use our church as a force of love and unity in this world and especially this next month. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen.